Awesome. Well, it's cool to see. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to get us started here and uh, then we'll go to Mike Moore tonight for our presentation um, on API security. All right, everyone. Um, this is our Denver MuleSoft meetup. Um, I have been organizing these along with Linda Gunn from Big Compass. Um, Big Compass is a service implementation partner with uh, with MuleSoft. And um, what we've tried, what we've been trying to do uh, over the last year is just to really bring the community together. Um, I think it's an exciting opportunity to be able to do these meetups virtually. Um, we'll see how this goes. It's going to be new for everyone, and at least in the near future, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, is, is these virtual meetups via Zoom? Uh, we have Mike Moore here from MuleSoft as our presenter, um, and Francois Lasalle, also from Ping Identity, who's been working in the background with Mike to make this presentation and, and demo possible. Um, Mike and Francois, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, though. Uh, just to reflect a little bit, I mentioned this very briefly, it's our one year anniversary of the Denver Meetup group. Um, so very exciting. Um, it's, it's very cool for me to see that, that we've done six meetups over the last year. So we're running about every other month. Um, and this is made possible by really all of you. Um, so thank you very much to the people that have been on site and um, you know, actually attended meetups in person and to the people who have been presenting. Uh, like Mike, who we have today. So uh, very uh, made very possible by all of you. And with the uptick in interest that I'm noticing, uh, I'm looking to actually run these about every 45 days in 2020. Uh, we have a few speakers lined up already in 2020 and a few topics um, that we've lined up already for 2020. So look for those next events to be published uh, pretty soon after this. Um, and I mentioned all of this, you know, just because obviously this is a very pivotal time, I think, for a lot of people, right? Um, we've come a long way. Uh, we're, we're currently making the switch to virtual meetups, uh, you know, which I hope is not here to stay because I really enjoy connecting with all of you in person. Um, but that is our situation currently. And so virtual meetups, what does that mean? Um, really what that means right now is meetups are over Zoom. Um, so what does that look like? And, and sorry to, you know, um, get some logistics out of the way, but to have a successful meetup, um, if you could please, please, please mute yourself. Um, basically, everyone besides Mike Moore, when he's presenting, should be muted so that we don't have any background noise. And, uh, you know, I'll just be scanning um, uh, the, the attendee list also, just to make sure, you know, um, if there is any background noise, um, I'll try to mute people as quickly as possible so we can have... Um, full audio from Mike. Um, put questions you have in the chat. What we're going to do is kind of host this like a webinar. Um, I think that'll be the best format. Um, so put your questions in the chat as we go, and then we'll take questions from the chat at the end, and I'll kind of moderate those for Mike um, at the very end. And then Mike also has a, a couple trivia questions. Um, also put the answers to those in the chat. Um, unfortunately, we you know no incentives to, to answer the trivia questions. Uh, this go around uh, just because it's a virtual meetup and MUSF couldn't offer any you know certification vouchers or, or uh, class vouchers this time around. Um, and then during the presentation, um, I'll probably put something in the chat, you know, maybe midway through um, at a natural break, uh, not to distract all of you, but I would love next topic ideas. And I have a sheet here to present at the end also just to confirm with everyone on uh, next topics. All right, so API security. Um, this has, has actually been presented um, almost a year ago now. Um, a similar topic, um, except slightly different. So we presented on API security, um, actually with, uh, with Ping Identity, and showing how MuleSoft can integrate with something called Ping Intelligence to um, help protect your MuleSoft APIs. But I'm really excited for this presentation because it provides a different angle on API security. And so Mike Francois and I kind of got together when, when uh, this idea had sort of been um, circulating. And Mike approached me that he had a great demo here um, that was mainly focusing on, on OAuth and, and the flow of, 
of OAuth and how that can be used to protect your MuleSoft APIs. Um, when Mike Francois and I also got together, there was a lot of discussion on the different paths that you could take here. Um, so I'm really excited to see what Mike has come up with and uh, especially the lessons learned um, that I believe he's prepared to talk about. Um, and if not, I definitely have some questions there um, for Mike because there's a lot of different paths that you can take here and, and Mike has explored, um, I believe, a couple of those for tonight. Um, so API security is also especially important now. Uh, we're mostly all at home, right, and in, in, in our industry, um, what that means um, is that, number one, you don't want an incident right now, right, so it's a little bit harder to, uh, to congregate when everyone's at home and react to an incident, um, but hackers are also all at home, um, and hackers have more time, um, so, you know, protect those APIs, um, secure your APIs, and that's going to be the theme of the night. Um, and we're not wrapping up, but I'm going to stop my share. Um, Francois, I'll let you introduce yourself and then you can pass it off to Mike for the presentation. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Uh, thanks everybody for participating. I love meetups and I'm so happy that it's one of the things that we can uh, continue to do as a community and I think Zoom's a great thing for that. Um, so yeah, Ping loves working at MuleSoft. You know, I love talking about API security been doing that for so long now and that's why we sponsor these and I think Ping and MuleSoft are very uh, complementary technologies from an API security perspective so it's really cool to see use cases with uh, showing off MuleSoft together with Ping. Uh, today, we, today we do something different uh, instead of Ping Intelligence we, we, uh, we use Ping Federate uh, working alongside MuleSoft. Thanks a lot for Mike Moore for putting this together and then lastly um, you know, if you run into anything uh, in your practice that uh, relates to Mule and Ping together, feel free to reach out if you need help. Uh, we'd love to uh, get engaged. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Mike, for uh, the use case. Yeah, thank you, Francois. I really appreciate all the help that you, you gave me um, getting set up for this. Um, so uh, as Aaron mentioned, the, the focus of, of tonight is really to, to look at OAuth and OIDC, and how those can be used to secure APIs, how they can interact with the AnyPoint platform. Um, we wanted to do this with Pink Federate, Pink Federate being a partner of MuleSoft and actually one of the first identity providers that we ever integrated with. So thanks for well for helping me get an environment set up, work through um, how to work with uh, Pink Federate for this demo. Um, that being said, I've, I've been diving down into various uh, identity providers, so I've done the, a similar um, pattern for Keycloak and Okta. So if your organization happens to be in those realms, happy to, to um, share any lessons learned there. Um, one of the things you'll see in this, this presentation is each one is a little bit different, but what we're gonna do today is, is set the foundation, understand what, the, what OAuth and OIDC are all about, and then get into a, a front to back demo that talks about security at the edge, as well as the layers of APIs and how we can um, use ping identity to apply fine grain access control to certain elements of data. Put my cursor here, right. So, you know, when we talk about a modern API, it's at its most basic, an interface to a system. They've been around for a long time. APIs can have different protocols, they can have different security, different data formats. When we talk about modern APIs though, we're really typically talking about HTTP, REST, they're developer friendly, easily accessible, and understood broadly. We treat them like products, so they're designed and documented with consumption in mind. Their version managed through a life cycle, and they're standardized, which allows for reuse. It also allows for consistent governance and the ability to monitor. So if we look at a modern API, it's an organization enabler. It removes friction, it increases velocity, and it opens up channels. My phone, it uses GPS data and API to my thermostat. So if I was able to leave the house, it would actually adjust as I got close to home and it would scale back as I left the house. Um, I no longer use Fidelity or E-Trade or Capital One to log in directly. I use personal capital and they leverage all the APIs that those providers expose to give me a singular view of my entire financial world. This weekend when it snows, CDOT is gonna provide me a real-time view of plow activity. So I'll know when the roads are gonna be cleared if I could leave the house. But when we think about those APIs, as Aaron mentioned, what does that really mean to the technologists, the architects, the CIO, the CISO? Ultimately, that is going to change our world. 
and we're going to have a more modern threat landscape. So we're not worried about just internal users. We have our data being exposed to a wider audience. It may be public facing. We have different devices, different channels. Ultimately, we have a bigger attack surface. We have motivated threat actors now. So it's not just hackers having fun. We might have sophisticated attacks because the data is valuable. And it's not necessarily just script kitties, right? It could be state-sponsored, well-funded organizations that are targeting your data because it is valuable data. The chance of being struck by lightning are one in 960,000. The chances of being affected by a data breach are one in four. And an average cost to an organization of a data breach is $3.62 million. So how can we avoid repeating mistakes of the past? We know that there have been a lot of well-publicized breaches, but to deal with a modern threat landscape, we need to adopt a modern security posture. And that really centers around a zero trust model. Security has changed from keeping the bad guys out and the good guys in to the fact that we need to open up data. It's critical to the organization. If you remember the days when you, if you're a good guy, nothing was available to you unless you were VPN'd in, that doesn't work anymore. And security by obscurity is unacceptable. We can't just not document things and hope no one finds them. Um, <clears throat> Some organizations think if they don't publish a specification, it's too hard to hack, but it's very easy to go and grab something out of the app store and learn everything about the API. It's very common. And ultimately, firewalling yourself off doesn't meet the needs of the organization. It doesn't completely address all of the security threats either. So how can we adopt a zero trust model? Well, what is zero trust? It ultimately is five pillars. And the first is take a capabilities-led view. So we need to understand <coughs> the bound domains and the functions, what the API is supposed to be doing, what data is it set to expose, and how is it going to be consumed, so that we can have targeted and focused protections. You have to deploy a distributed enforcement model. So we need to protect the front-end presentation layer, but we also need to protect the back-end connectivity to the data source. We need to know and understand the assets in use and their relationships and adopt a continuous approach. This is not a one-time one activity. We need to continuously monitor and iterate and be able to surface anomalies with traffic moving through the network. And lastly, we need to be able to provide verifiable identities to APIs and consumers. And when we do that, we need to be able to grant access based on what we know about the caller and its context. So the, the client and the user context. So if we look at the AnyPoint platform, there are aspects of what Mule provides that addresses the first four. When you take a capabilities-led view, that really speaks to API-led and a three-tier architecture. Segmenting data access at the system layer, aggregation, orchestration, business logic in the process layer, and a specific channel-based presentation at the experience API layer. API management and last mile security can be used to apply a distributed enforcement model. We can apply different policies based on what the APIs are and how they're being consumed. Within Asset Discovery, Exchange and Visualizer gives you a sense for what applications are, are out there, what their dependencies are. Visualizer can give you a real-time map of how APIs are interacting with each other. And Visualizer and Monitoring can be used to surface up anomalies, hotspots in your application network, and understand your, your traffic patterns in real time. But ultimately, in the platform, Having verifiable identities to APIs and consumers is not really what MuleSoft is all about. So we need an, an additional component, and that's where a, an IDP like Ping Identity and Ping Federate come into play. And when we talk about these composed APIs, and, and <clears throat> it's a bit different than a monolithic architecture that we would have in the past. If we had a user come in, once they're in the, the UI and they've authenticated, that user store is probably part of the monolithic uh, architecture in the first place. We know everything about the user, we know the security context, and all the business logic is encapsulated inside of a single application. So it makes it very simple to secure the interactions of that particular system. But when we talk about these composed APIs, we, we have a much bigger uh, challenge. Microservices may be calling other downstream microservices, neither will trust each other, neither will have a user context because the user is not interacting directly with them anymore. And so ultimately we have to adapt our architectural patterns, to be able to secure these at, at each layer of the API-led model. So 
if we start at the experience API, we want we take a mobile application. We want to be able to ensure that that mobile application is trusted and allowed to access the API. We also want to allow the user to authenticate without sharing credentials to the API or system directly because that's not the concern. That's not where the user store potentially even lies. And we want to be able to share user context and a revocable access token with that application to make calls on behalf of the user. Again, without sharing actual uh, user credentials or other secrets. If we look at the communication between the layers of APIs, APIs have to be identified and authorized to call each other. We don't want insecure APIs at the process or system layer. We want to ensure that whatever application is calling those is trusted and is known and we can identify them. We can't necessarily leverage the original end user token because the the contract or the relationship was not with those backend system APIs. Those are there to help provide data to the experience API that the user is actually interacting with as part of the client application. And we also need to be able to authenticate headlessly. So there is no human interaction. So that is a different behavior than a mobile app authenticating an author and a user authorizing on behalf of um, that client application. And then at the system layer, we won't only want to serve data to approve API clients again, but we also want to be able to validate the end user and its context for data filtering and masking or enrichment. So we need to be able to persist the user context down the stack and actually use that for, for fine-grained data access control. So when we think about the modern API and decomposed systems, OAuth and OpenID Connect can come into play to help solve these problems. So first is OAuth. OAuth is an open, open authentication protocol, and it, it, it's used for delegated authorization. So this means that a user is no longer sending credentials directly to a resource provider. It's working with an IDP like Ping Federate to authenticate itself and then authorize applications to access certain data on its behalf. It's ultimately a completely open framework for authorization, which means it does not define how to perform authentication. It's completely generic, it's open to interpretation, and it's open to implementation. This makes it flexible. So it, it can be used for IoT use cases, it can be used for API access management, it's used for social media, but every implementation is different. Um, organizations will use it in completely different contexts. When we are talking about APIs, typically what we're, we're referring to is granting access to a client or an application to a resource by requesting permission from a third party, which is the identity provider. Uh, in OAuth, the contents and structure of the tokens are undefined by default, so what's inside those tokens is, again, left open-ended. And that's where OpenID Connect comes into play. So OpenID Connect attempts to define a more strict definition of tokens and, and user auth authentication flows so that they're a bit more predictable um, across identity providers, across API management uh, platforms. So what are those OIDC standards that are added on to the, the OAuth um, framework? The first is a well-known uh, OpenID configuration. And this is the contract, it's the source of truth for interacting with an identity provider. Um, you can think of it almost like a whistle for a SOAP service but it's highly useful in troubleshooting your interactions between the Anypoint platform and your identity provider of choice. So what's gonna be inside of this is going to be all of the endpoints that you need to set up the platform to authorize an application, obtain an access token, introspect or validate an access token, ID token or refresh token, to register a client application, get user information or even invalidate a session. It's also gonna have all of the grant types that a client application may be able to request on behalf of a user um, and can be authorized for. It will also <coughs> list any supported scopes or claims that the IDP may support, again, to enrich that user context um, and help <coughs> a API management or a implementation understand what they can do with that user's context. So, Let's talk about the, the normal grant types that we use when we're talking about API security. 
the first is authorization code and optionally with proof key for code exchange. So this allows a user to authenticate and authorize directly with the IDP or the client app to obtain an access token on behalf of the user. Again, this means that the user credentials are not going to the API layer. They're not um, being shared directly with the mobile app. They're actually being passed straight to the IDP. The IDP will then give the mobile app a authorization code that it can exchange for an access token and then make calls to the API on behalf of the user. The access token says that that app can do what it's, what it is requested access to do, and it has a user context where the user is granted it permission to do those things. PKCE is a code challenge and it's a, a verifier that's used uh, during an authorization code exchange. This is used when you have a mobile or a single page app where it could be, uh, the, all the source code is available, it could be easily seen, and so you cannot trust that client side application to be able to, to hold on to client secrets that it would use to interact with the IDP. Uh, basically, when the authorization code exchange happens, a, um, a hash value or some other unique value is sent along with it, stored in the IDP, and then validated before an access token is actually granted again uh, to ensure that there was no interception of that request. So, as mentioned, credentials are not passed to the API application. Uh, you can support a refresh token, so you're not constantly, every two hours, you know, pinging the user to reauthorize the application. Um, the application can take its existing access token and actually get a refresh. Um, and what you would see is this is normally used for native and web applications uh, that are using the authorization code grant uh, because they can, they can protect the client secret to the identity provider. Again, single page apps, uh, mobile apps, typically what you will see there, um, they'll use PKC as well. Now, when we talk about system-to-system -system communication, again, we mentioned that it needs to be headless. So this is where a client credential grant type would come into play. So when the resource owner is not a person or otherwise uh, stated as machine-to-machine, -machine, so what is happening in this uh, exchange is credentials are being exchanged with the IDP for an access token to call a downstream API. So a client ID and secret will go up to the IDP, an access token will come back, and the access token will be used for downstream calls to, to other APIs. The last here is implicit grant, and this grant type is somewhat falling out of favor in, in favor for PKCE as a more secure method. Uh, it's very similar to authorization code grant, but the access token exchange happens immediately, so an auth code doesn't come back. Um, and so uh, the, the access token comes back to the client app. So it does have a user context. The user does have to authenticate to the IDP. There just isn't a authorization code exchange in an implicit grant. So if you're not familiar with OAuth, this is probably the most common way you've seen it in, in play. And what we have here is uh, a Koala quiz. That would basically be the client application. Koala quiz is asking for access to Al's public profile, their friends list, email address, timeline post, and birthday, photos, and likes. So this is the scope of access and the actions at the domain. You can see at the bottom, this doesn't allow the app to post to Facebook. So this is what the client application can do on behalf of that user. I've logged in, or Al is logged in. So that is the user context. When you click continue, that's saying to the, the IDP that I'm allowing this to happen. An auth code will come back, Koala Quiz will exchange that for an access token and continue on um, with the ability to access those pieces of information about the user. So in the chat, uh, what, what is this typically referred to for those of you that are familiar with OAuth? And I can't see the chat, so I don't know if anyone's answered it, but uh, if you haven't, that, that's the OAuth dance. And so again, to, to reiterate the steps here, First, the client application requests a token from the provider. The provider returns a token. The client application will include that token either as an authentication header or query parameter and a request to the API. Uh, from there, the uh, access token enforcement policy inside of the Mule API manager would then intercept the request, communicate with the identity provider to validate the token, 
from there, the validated token would be whitelisted. We, we, we cache it um, and, until expiration. So any further requests, um, if, if it's cached, we'll, we'll cache it locally for, for performance reasons. Otherwise, we'll continue to call the introspection endpoint to ensure that that token is valid. Um, if the token is valid, the request will then be forwarded to the API. And at that point, the API will respond to the client application with the data. So for those of you uh, participating in the chat, what type of OAuth authorization would this be referred to and why? Mike, one of the answers was client auth and somebody else said security token. Somebody else's client credentials, mm -hmm. somebody said implicit. Okay. Uh, so this, this is an example of an authorization code grant type. Uh, and, and in OAuth, we would call this a three-legged um, three interaction because it's in ultimately involving three different parties to get an access token. It involves the application itself, the OAuth service um, or IDP, and the user itself. Uh, to contrast that, when we talk about system-to-system -system interaction, oh, sorry. So here's a, uh, just before we switch over to that, uh, just a, a breakdown of the access token validation policy of what would happen. So again, the access token is retrieved. Once we make a call to the API, we would validate the input token, validate, against, validate the access token against the OAuth provider, validate the scopes. Uh, optionally, we can validate the client ID, and I'll talk about why you may or may not want to do this, but what this is going to look at is ensuring that the application that's passing the access token actually has a, a contract with the API that the policy is sitting on top of. Um, assuming everything's good, again, that enriched request will travel down to the actual API and the, and, uh, the backend API, and the data will be passed back to the client. So to contrast that, uh, a two-legged would be an OAuth client credentials grant. And again, this is used for system to system, um, a process API to a system API, an experience API to a process API. Uh, anywhere that we would be able to trust the client ID in secret, and we need to, this to be headless and not necessarily have a user context. So what happens in the, that interaction is we'll authenticate to the identity provider with the client ID in secret. The identity provider will immediately reply back with an access token. And then we can use that access token to request the resources inside the system API and ultimately return the response. So to build on the, the grant types that we talked about, OIDC and OAuth create a few other standards. Um, the first being scopes. And what this relates to is what information can you obtain or access about the authenticated user uh, for OIDC clients, OpenID is a required scope. You can add others. And typically what you'll see is they, they usually re relate to nouns and verbs that map to the API resource and methods. So maybe I can read orders. Maybe I can write or create an order. I can read accounts. Um, but really it is open-ended. It could be based on certain you know, data elements. It could be organizational structure or something like that. But ultimately it's related to what are you going to try to do on the API? And if you're familiar with API Manager inside of MuleSoft, we can apply policy against specific, um, against the entire API or against specific resources and methods. So you can actually define a specific scope that only affects the ability to post an order, right? Or get orders. Uh, and so the scopes can, can also align to resources and method, methods in your API definition. In addition to scopes, you also have claims, and these are additional key value pairs that are related to the user context. These are not things that we would necessarily evaluate in the policy itself, um, but this could be used by the service implementation to control fine-grained data access um, or filtering of data. And then the tokens. Uh, we have two major types that will be issued, an access token or an, or an ID token. The access token is used to access the resource, uh, possibly with a user context, if we're talking about an auth code grant or implicit grant, uh, and a specific set of claims or scopes. The token itself 
can be a JSON web token or JWT, either signed or unsigned, or it could be an opaque token. The ID token, very similar, provides all the user context, claims, and scopes, but can't actually be at, used to access a resource and get data. Uh, the tokens that are issued could be validated locally. Uh, a JSON web token validation policy um, could, could validate that locally without checking against the IDP um, or against the IDP introspection. So if you're using any of the access token validation policies, those are going to be validated against Pink Federate. Um, if you issue an opaque token, that's something that we wouldn't be able to um, introspect, and that always has to go back to the IDP for introspection. So as mentioned, the OpenID Connect Access Token Validation Policy, the Pink Federate Access Validation Policy, um, OpenAM, they will all validate tokens looking in the authorization header against the IDP. You, you can't uh, pass the token anywhere else. Um, it's it's hard-coded to look at the authorization header. Uh, by default, the, it validates that the tokens are issued to a vi valid client application. You could disable that to allow tokens to be validated by a downstream API that it was not necessarily issued for. You also have the ability to expose headers, and this is going to make all the claim and user information available to the API, which could be used for role-based access control, um, attribute-based access control. Uh, what this will do is it'll prefix all the headers with x dash agw dash whatever the claim or scope name was. Um, and from there, you can persist that down to other APIs in the system or uh, use them in the particular API that is receiving and validating that token. Alternatively, you can also do JWT validation. And this is going to locally validate the contents of the token against the configured policy and the identity provider's public key or uh, JWKS um, URI. So this can validate the token was issued to the expected client app or ID. That's also able to be defeated as well. You can validate custom claims against literals or data weave expressions. You can validate the issuer or the audience. Um, but as I mentioned, you cannot use this if the IDP is issuing opaque tokens. Uh, the token can be encrypted, it can be signed. Uh, this is down to the particular IDP configuration and how you set up token issuance. And once you have uh, validated the token, you can also access uh, claim information uh, for the API, even if you don't expose headers, they'll be made available in the vars.claim set claim uh, expression or the, the authentication object. So let's go back to the, the API-led architecture and see where all this is going to layer in. So with a mobile app, we would use auth code grant to authenticate the user directly to the IDP, and we'll exchange the authorization code for an access token. We'll then take the access token, um, and the access token validation policy is going to communicate with the IDP, and then cache the response so that we know that the token is valid. Optionally, we can pass those scopes and claims um, downstream as headers for downstream APIs, or we can use them in the experience API implementation. When we talk about movement to an experience, or, or sorry, to a process or system API, um, we can use the client credentials grant with OpenID Connect access token enforcement policy or Pink Federate access token policy. And again, what this is going to do is it's going to call the IDP, get an access token, call the downstream API. The downstream API will call the IDP and ensure that that experience API or process API is actually entitled to call um, the system API or, or otherwise. Alternatively, if uh, you did not want to do OAuth in this uh, circumstance, you can still apply clientity-based policy enforcement. So the platform does know that those clients exist, uh, even though they're created in the IDP. And so standard rate limiting, throttling, um, any client-based policies will still apply, even if you didn't necessarily want to secure um, using OAuth or OIDC. And then as we get down to the system APIs, the role-based access control, you could enforce that in any layer of the API, but you may want, you know, customers may prefer to enforce it down at the system API so that you're not unnecessarily uh, transmitting data that has to be filtered out up the stream. So you can also extract the user information from the headers, the ID token, the access token via JWT validation, or by validating it against the identity provider. 
So I, I bring those uh, options up about persisting a token down the stack for the reason that while the experience API is going to introspect, introspect the token and can put all of the claims and scope information, it's a question for each organization on whether they trust uh, that permissions will not be elevated there. Um, if you extract the headers and then pass them down the stack and use that for uh, data filtration, you are tr explicitly trusting that that experience API has not manipulated those headers, that it is taking the, the response straight from the IDP and uh, exposing it appropriately. If we take a ID token or access token and we validate it via JWT or against the IDP, we know that that token was issued by the identity provider. It has claims and scopes that the identity provider intended to place on that token. So it is a, a consideration and each organization is gonna have their own risk tolerance. So let's get into a demo and we'll see all of this in action. over here right okay so if you're gonna go and set up ping federate to your anypoint org you're gonna start here and we'll be inside of client providers and this does look a little bit different this week because we just released uh, support for multiple client providers so for those of you that may have an externally facing auth server that has partners or third-party vendors or whomever or you have uh, all servers that are dev focused only and production focused only. Uh, we have support for that now. Um, it just released this weekend, um, but you'll come into this screen and you'll add a client provider. Again, Pink Federate was one of our first um, partners and the interaction with Pink Federate existed before OpenID Connect was really a thing. So um, they have their own uh, designation in the platform. They have their own policies, but Largely, it follows the same behavior as OpenID Connect um, with a few uh, benefits. Um, by its nature, OpenID Connect is kind of a one-way um, behavior. So after the client exists in the, the IDP, uh, the platform typically cannot manipulate it. Uh, if we're talking about rotating uh, client secrets or things like that, that actually needs to originate in the identity provider. Uh, Pink Federate provides endpoints that allow us to delete clients, allow us to rotate secrets, things like that directly from the platform. Um, so that's why they have a slightly different designation um, in the setup here. All right. So. I mentioned that every identity provider that supports OIDC is going to have a well-known configuration. And this is the strict contract that everything in the platform looks at for what we can support. So if we look through here, everything that you need to set up uh, communication to the platform is in this, this um, JSON object. We have the issuer, we have an authorization endpoint, the token endpoint, uh, token introspection endpoint, uh, registration, if we look down, we see all the different claims that a client application could request. We can see the different response types that are, that are supported, the grant types that are supported. This is a very uh, important part of this document. So our UI, when we talk about registering a client application in exchange, is driven by the contents of this document. There are, there are some IDPs that do not support this full list and require workarounds to do things like client credential grants. So if we look through here, you can see it's simply a copy paste. Um, we will need our own client ID and secret to um, access the platform for token introspection, things like that. And once that's done, uh, the platform basically becomes a pass through. So whenever you go to register a client instead of exchange, uh, all of that actually just flows straight through to Ping Federate. So what I've got here in the demo today is uh, an experience API, a system API, hits a backend database and a client application. And what I've got set up is we have the experience API with Ping Federate access token enforcement policy and the system API with Ping Federate access token enforcement policy as well as JWT validation, which should be disabled right now. Um, we'll 
we'll go through a couple of different ways that we can deal with the token validation. Okay, so <clears throat> what's, what I have set up here is we'll do authorization code grant between the client application and the experience API, and we'll do client credentials between the experience API and the system API. And what that looks like in the application itself uh, for the experience API is, is very simple. It's just an HTTP requester. And as we scroll down here um, on the author authentication, we can select a client credentials grant type. It will ask what the client ID and secret um, are that it should use to get a token and what scopes. So again, this will align to our experience API uh, that's authorized to call the system API. It will handle all of the, the back and forth with the IDP and um, it enhance that request before it goes out with the appropriate access token. Okay. So if we call this, this API right now, uh, the token's been revoked. I'm, I'm using an old access token, so it's not allowed. So let's go get a fresh access token. So what I've got here, um, I don't have a, a sample mobile app to, to demonstrate this, but what I've got is a simple application that is going to call back and exchange for an access token. So when you call for an auth code, one, we'll look at the URL here. So this is our This is our ping instance. So we're going to call authorization.oauth. We're going to give it the client ID for the mobile app that we had registered. And then as I scroll across, we're asking for a code back in the response type, scope of open ID, and a redirect URI. And this redirect URI is stored in ping federate. And what this says is, where do I send that authorization code to? So it's going to go to a, a little Cloud Hub app that I put out called OAuth Exchange Token. And that token is going to take the authorization, or that app is going to take the authorization code and exchange it for an, auth, an access token. So this is exactly what would happen in the dance if you were a mobile app. You would get the token back and then start making downstream API calls. Okay. So, Let's call this endpoint. Uh, new window. Okay. So you can see I'm redirected to the IDP. Uh, I'm going to authenticate directly with the IDP. And I'll get back an access token. So you can see we're not interacting with the IDP anymore, we're, we're at my Cloud Hub application, and we have this access token now. So I'm going to grab this, and what we can do here is, let's first introspect the access token, because this is ultimately what the, the API policy is going to do. So we can call uh, the introspect endpoint that was listed in the well-known comp, tell it it's an access token, and make that request. And what we can see is, we know that the, the token is active, so it's valid. We know um, the scope, the username. We have an email here. We have some additional claims that were added. And ultimately, we have the user context now, uh, as well as the client application that it was issued to. So we have everything we need to start ac exercising the APIs. So we can now take that, that access token and add this in and call that in. And we get flight information back uh, for the destination of LAX. So let's take a look at the logs here, and we can see the interaction between the applications. So I'm here in my experience API, and I'm going to scroll up slightly. OK. Um, keep going. All right. So we can see what I've got here is, is uh, wire debugging turned on. And so we get to the right line here. All right. So we can see that the token, uh, sorry, when we make the call, we're calling the introspection endpoint. So the, the request has come in. This, this was the actual request. We now call out the introspection endpoint inside of ping. Uh, 
and pass in the, the payload. Ping actually replies back with the same thing that we kind of saw in the, the introspection endpoint, right? Now that we know that that's valid, we can allow that request to go into the downstream API. And a couple of things that I've got turned on here on the policy is, I'll go into edit here. So one, just to keep things simple, I have this applied to all methods and resources. Um, because this is, this is running with a self-signed certificate, I've got the validate certificate turned off right now. Um, and I've got exposed headers turned on. And so what will happen is when exposed headers is turned on, as I mentioned, all of the scopes and information about the user context will get added as headers that can be used inside the experience API, um, could be used to, to propagate downstream. Okay. And so, so from there, let's scroll down to this one. We can see that that information will get passed down when we call the actual system API here on the host here. And the system API will accept the, the request and uh, post out. So one thing that we, we did have to do was actually go get a new client credentials token because the other one had already expired. So this is actually the exchange against Pink Federate to go and get a new client credentials grant for the experience API to be able to call the system API. Okay. And that, that ends up on the author, authorization header here. Okay. So if we look at the system API itself, and again, what I've got here is the same ping better access token enforcement policy. Um, it's gonna be looking at that that contract between the experience API and the system API. But I've also got a JWT validation policy here. So if we looked at, at uh, Postman, I can call for LAX, I can call for SFO, um, both are gonna return data. But what if I wanted to use some of the information about the user to control what data access they can actually get back? So one of the ways that we can do this is uh, using a local JWT validation policy. You can use this to validate that it's a valid token without calling the IDP. You can also use it to pull things out of the, the token and evaluate them. So one of the things that I did in the experience API is I, I took the, uh, the original access token that's coming in from the mobile app and I, I assigned it to a, a value called upstream client token. And when I get down to the system API, I'm gonna look at that token and locally validate it. And you can see we have the different signing methods, the key link, um, again, the key origin, whether we use the public key or we grab the um, JWKS URI. One of the things that I'm doing here is I'm skipping the client ID validation. Again, because that access token was actually generated for the experience API, I'm not looking to ensure that the, the access token matches my system API specifically, but I am interested to know that it is valid and tell me about the actual user context. So what I've got here is validating a custom claim, and this is a very simplified um, example, but what I'm looking at is the airport claim that we had added to that user. Um, if you recall, it's set to SFO. And what I'm looking at is that the bars claim set airport matches the attributes query parameters uh, destination. So I'm looking to see if I'm looking up an airport flight information that I actually have access to. And if I don't, then it should be uh, rejected. The JVT policy also has non-mandatory claim val validations where it will report whether or not it's valid, but it not, won't necessarily fail the request. So let me apply this and it's gonna take a, um, you know, up to 60 seconds to apply, but we'll eventually see that take effect. And so while that's, while that's taking effect, we can, we can also see the interaction um, Ping had with the system API. So again, you, you can see I've got this uh, experience API set to mirror those parameters down so we could always look at the headers for the same information. But if we weren't sure that we wanted to trust the experience API to set these correctly or uh, not manipulate them, we can also validate the token locally ourselves. So let's see. 
let's let that take effect. Mike, do you want to take a quick question while it's taking effect? Sure. All right, so this one's from Greg Loring. I've been, I've been just uh, telling these up in my notes as we go. Um, it said bounded domains, says DDD to me. Is that correct? I believe what he means there is domain-driven design. Yeah, typically when we talk about the three-layer architecture, that's, that's really around domains, about what the data entities are and what they can do. All right, so our new policy has now taken effect and we got an error back that says invalid token. So what's happening here is, you know, if we change this back to SFO, we'll be good to go because the access token is valid, but we're also looking at that upstream client token with the JWT policy and LAX does not match the access that Rianne has. Rianne can only access flight data on SFO. So if we switch back to system here. We, we can see that that failure now. Okay. So ultimately, a couple different ways to deal with, with token validation. Um, you can introspect straight against the access point or, or against the identity provider. You can validate those locally with the JWT policy. You can grab claims out of either one. Um, or you can grab them out of the headers uh, from an upstream API that's being propagated down. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, I've been working with quite a few IDPs. I've, I've messed around a little bit with Salesforce even and one login. Um, what I've found that even across these identity providers, they're not even necessarily the most consistent at supporting OpenID Connect. Uh, the big one for us, as I mentioned, is support for dynamic client registration. So when we go to register a client application, like this, uh, we'll go off to an app instance here. So when we go to request access, this is where dynamic client registration is happening. When we say, I want to create a new application, this is ultimately treating the platform as a pass through now to go and create something inside of ping. So if we created a, a, a web client now and we said it is client credentials or authorization code, that's actually going to go and create inside of ping. And ultimately, um, we will only populate the UI elements that uh, the IDP supports. So that well-known configuration and the grant types that are listed here, uh, here, are what we look at. If that's not listed in that document, it will not be visible in the UI because we know that it will fail, right? And so when we go and create that web application then request access, that's ultimately building that over inside of ping. So this quantity and seeker were actually generated by Ping Federate. So when I when I looked at different uh, identity providers, one login, Azure AD, they don't support client dynamic client registration. So you would have to create the clients in the IDP and then make API calls to the platform to inform the platform that those clients actually exist for things like client ID validation policies, rate limiting, throttling, things like that. It's doable. Um, it's just extra manual uh, orchestration that you would need to do. Not every identity provider supports client credential grant. Uh, Salesforce doesn't. Okta doesn't. You can work around this. Again, you have to register clients. And uh, one of the, the ways that I've seen it done is you register the clients and set them to auth code grant. And then you go back into the platform uh, for Okta or Salesforce and go and manually turn on client credentials grant. So even though the, the Anypoint platform sees off code, there's actually an additional grant type back there. And then you're not really using OIDC scopes at that point. If you passed it OpenID as a scope, it would fail, but you can use other OAuth scopes. So um, to the third point, it's you can always implement OAuth without OIDC, 
then you can always leverage what you can out of OIDC and augment with other API security controls. You can register uh, system system clients with auth code grant types and, or, and only use client ID or secret policies or use the client credentials grant type. So again, the platform does know when you create a client through that dynamic client registration process, what the client ID is and can apply those rate limiting throttling policies, um, assuming that you have dynamic client registration supported and set up. As mentioned, the platform depends on that well-known configuration data. We will not do anything that is not in that document because it will ultimately fail uh, because that is the strict contract. So you may have to build inter interactions directly to the IDP. Uh, you may have to build custom validation policies. Again, as you saw, the policy is really just calling out to an, to an introspection endpoint and getting a response back and in interpreting that response. Um, something that could certainly be done in a custom policy if uh, the out-of-the-box policies don't work for your, your potential use case. Um, client policies can be driven by the access token validation. So um, you, you notice that when I called the APIs, I wasn't also passing in a client ID header, or client secret header. Um, we're we're going to validate the access token. And as you saw, the response back from that is we know that that access token was generated for a particular client ID. And so we can drive those client-based policies just on receiving the access token. And you can reference it by calling authentication.principal um, in a mule expression. Uh, one last bit, um, the OAuth spec has a gap that hasn't been addressed. So one thing that would make this a bit more straightforward is if we had a concept of on behalf of. Uh, it's in draft in, in the OAuth spec, but it would allow for a token exchange where an experience API could take that access token, exchange it for one that it needs to call a process API, call a system API, and, and move down the line. I know that Pink Federer has this concept, um, but was not able to give it a lot of time to uh, dig into that, uh, to know exactly how that would be implemented, um, or if it would even be supported by us out of the box, or if that would be something that would need to be dealt with in a custom implementation or custom policy. But ultimately, that will eventually make it into the OAuth spec, and it will evolve to deal with um, these service-to-service -service interactions in a little bit more clean way. Um, that being said, the mixture of auth code at the edge and client credentials gets us pretty close, and the ability to locally validate the, the upstream token, uh, we can at least get the user context and know that it came from a trusted source. All right, so that's the end of my demo, and I'm gonna get a few more trivia questions out here. So in the chat, what are the two types of tokens an identity provider may issue? We have access and auth and jet, opaque, client ID, auth token. Yeah, um, so an ID token and an access token. And what are the two ways that a token be, can be formatted? I, I think I may have heard at least one of those. It's like, ah, uh, Francois coming with the answer. JWT and opaque. What are the three ways that we can validate user claims in the processor system layer? Sounds like you can see the chat now, Mike. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts from anyone? All right, so one, we could get the headers from the experience API. We've introspected the token upstream. We can pass those down. Another is we could take the access token or ID token and use local JWT validation. 
And lastly, we could call the introspection endpoint with an access or ID token uh, to validate that as part of a custom policy or in the service implementation itself. All right, and so Aaron, I know you were collecting some questions during the session. I'll turn it over to you. All right, um, and for everyone, who didn't get their questions out, maybe you were noting them as you went, that's what I was doing. Uh, feel free to put those in the chat now if you have any additional questions. But we have one from Carmela Leon. Uh, could tokens be targeted by hackers? So yes, I mean, ultimately if you have an access token, um, it could grant you access to call APIs and get data on, on behalf of a user. Um, access tokens can be encrypted. Um, they're they can also you know, be signed so that you can ensure that a token hasn't been created by someone other than the IDP. Uh, it can be encrypted so that um, it can't be uh, <coughs> parsed locally. Uh, opaque tokens um, also can't be locally introspected. Um, the, you know, the goal of the access token is it's short-lived. Um, it has a validity period that's configurable. Um, could be an hour, could even be minutes. Um, uh, two hours seems to be kind of the norm. The idea being that if a if an access token is harvested, um, it has a limited amount of time that it can access the system. Um, I know that, and Francois, feel free to chime in here, but um, I think ping intelligence would be um, a potential additional layer in the API gateway to determine yeah. an access token is being yeah, so uh, accessed okay. from different yeah, most of the time tokens are bare tokens, right? Without signatures and things like that. Right? So that for sure uh, increases the consequence of a, a token leaking. But yeah, you're right. It's not just about the token itself leaking, but what people do with the token after it's leaked. Yeah. But that part of it is what Fing Intelligence would be looking like. We would be looking at the behavior and say, hey, this token has probably been compromised because of the behavior we see on it. So it's kind of like a second layer of protection for that kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah, so the token has a limited lifespan um, and it can always be revoked as well. Um, and so, you know, as mentioned, we cache, we cache the response from the IDP for 60 seconds by default, that's configurable. But, you know, if, if you, for whatever, somehow you made a determination that a token had been leaked um, or is being used um, maliciously, you could always revoke that in the IDP and the gateway would re reflect that within 60 seconds. Um, how you come to that determination is something that ping intelligence could help with in observing patterns of API traffic um, and making that determination that a token is being used in a way that's, that's not typical. And then through encryption and signing, you can do things to prevent um, information if there's any sensitive information inside the token from being uh, intercepted. It's a great question. You know, you can go down a lot of different uh, rabbit holes there. I think with that question, and uh, the only other thing I'll add is, is it's extremely difficult to detect when a, a token is hijacked, and, and that's where I think you know the, the AI engine and machine learning um, tools that are out there, like Ping Intelligence, really you know provide a lot of value. Yep. Um, one for me, Mike. Um, I've never actually seen uh, just a hard recommendation on this, um, but is there a recommendation on how long a token should be valid for, or is it just totally dependent on the use case? I think it's use case dependent. Um, you know, again, it's it's that tolerance and what the tolerance is for responsiveness. So, with an authorization code, um, as long as you allow for refresh tokens, that that client application continue can continue to refresh its token um, and ensure that it you know, it's being issued to the trusted client application. Um, it just creates a bit more traffic on the IDP if that's a, a very short lived token. Um, you know, <clears throat> ultimately it's that balance for how long you want a token to be active versus continuously calling back to the IDP to, to refresh that. Yeah. All right, one from Omar Hernandez. Um, OAuth exchange is available as an asset or we must build our own resource. So the, the little uh, cloud, cloud of application that I showed today is uh, basically mimicking the behavior that a mobile application would do. So in that interaction, 
uh, you know, a mobile application would direct the user at the IDP and the IDP would issue the authorization code to a callback URI in the mobile app. Um, in, in this case, I didn't have a mobile app, so I just uh, sent it to a Cloud Hub app. And what's happening at that point is that authorization code then gets exchanged with an access token. So that would be your web app, your mobile app, or, or anything like that. All right, one more from me. Um, are the different parts of the token only available from you know, Mel Expressions and, and Mule 3 or you know, Data Weave and Mule 4 um, when the policy is actually enforced via API Manager? So you, you will, you'll have the authorization header. Um, by default, like when you go through any of these um, validation policies, we'll, we'll parse the, the response and have the option to put the headers on. But we don't strip that out, so that authorization header is still present. So you can call things like authentication.principal and get access to the client ID that's part of the access token. Yep. Thank you. And then one more from, I'm sorry if I butchered the name, Iram Mohammed. Uh, how can I assign the required claims to open ID token ID response? So that's going to differ by each of the IDPs. Um, and, and Francois can jump in here because I, I kind of peeked over his shoulder after he set it up for me. But um, in Ping, there's a, there's a token manager and it talks about the token instance. And you know, with, with Ping Federate, it's sitting over the, the IDP. And so you, you're basically going down and pulling uh, user attributes, whether that's a, you know, a CN, SN, or any kind of custom attribute, and um, defining a, ultimately how that value is going to derive, whether it's just a direct mapping or some kind of formula. That's right. Exactly. So for, for Ping Federate, when I, I went and tweaked that to uh, tailor the attributes you want in your demo, I, uh, I would go and define a contract associated with a token issuing and I have the opportunity to go and pull these attribute values either from uh, an LDAP that we're interacting with as part of the authentication, but it could be a, an outbound call or another set of, you know, uh, a value store. Um, and uh, yeah, we just Put these things together and then the next tokens that get issued at that point uh, includes these additional claims. Yeah and uh, Francois correct me if I'm wrong but you can actually get pretty advanced with this. Um, I think Ping uses Angle but um, you know you can actually have some pretty complex scripts that actually derive whatever value you want to actually put on a claim or a, a scope. It's very flexible and yeah you'd be surprised at, at how complicated some tokens can become. Yeah. Great. I believe there's just one more question. Uh, again, it's from me. Um, just for the group, you know, I, I can think of some. Um, just for the group, Mike, you know, I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the advantages of maintaining those client IDs in an external identity provider? You know, that's not real spot. So when you when you're using the platform as just a client credential store, um, it limits you to really just those client and secrets that exist in the platform. The platform becomes that standalone repository. Um, but we, we aren't going to be an OAuth server, an OIDC server. And so you can almost think of, if you're using just basic client and secret policy, you know, ultimately that's, that is an identifier and a secret. That's a username and password. Um, the benefits of federating to an identity provider like this is that you have the ability to add user context. You have the ability to add um, a lot more uh, enriched data about the user or the system that's being consumed, uh, as well as <clears throat> you know, ultimately be able to support the, um, accepting an access token that can be revoked, that can be short-lived. Whereas if you had just client and secrets going back and forth, um, when you revoke that or recycle that, um, you know, you have to go in and change the application configuration and things like that. This and and ultimately, you know, if those are if those are compromised, um, Sorry. they may be able to be used uh, in more than just the particular context of a particular API. So, also, an access token is bound by a specific scope, which may be a certain interaction um, 
with certain pieces of data versus a client in secret for a client application may have access to many different APIs. Great. So if there's no other questions, I'll give everyone, you know, maybe 10 more seconds to put questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to take over the screen share. That was, that was everything, right, Mike? Yep. All right. Uh, a virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So last little bit here. Can everyone see PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what's next? We're just wrapping up. Um, MuleSoft Connect is May 20th and it's virtual. Um, it is free. So feel free to attend. Um, there will be some, some great learnings at MuleSoft Connect. Uh, there will be also a community meetup. Um, I mentioned that because we're continuing with virtual meetups for the near future. You know, uh, we all know why we've all been affected by the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but you know, just because we're physically isolated doesn't mean that we can't still connect as a community. Um, so I would love to, like I said at the beginning of this, continue to try to run these about every 45 days uh, into 2020. Um, so for the foreseeable future, they will be on Zoom. Um, so it's easy to attend at least. Uh, and thank you all for attending this one. Um, and then what I got for next topics ideas, this has been a list building from previous meetups as well as this meetup. Um, so thanks to everyone who's put their ideas in the chat. Um, I've got service mess, uh, service mesh, sorry, uh, integration with AWS microservices. Uh, both of these seem to be coming up actually over and over. Um, and I'll skip to the bottom here as well. Uh, data weave best practices. Um, we actually have somebody who's, who's local to Denver, uh, Josh Ernie, who uh, plans actually on presenting data weave best practices again in, in 2020. He had a great, uh, great presentation on data weave best practices. Um, in 2019. Um, so we'll definitely plan on doing that one. Uh, I've heard ETL best practices, um, and this can go a lot of different routes, um, but I've heard monitoring and testing and mapping and M unit testing and ETL versus ELT also. So ex extract, transform, load versus extract, load, and transform. And we could even do something there, you know, along the lines of, of loading data into Snowflake from an integration. Um, with an inbound and outbound endpoint and then visualizing that data in Tableau since that use case is becoming ever more common. Uh, API design best practices and more security topics. Uh, this always seems to make the list. There's plenty of security topics that we could talk about. Um, one such being that I've heard is tokenization service, um, which would come with runtime fabric. And I also, I just saw in the chat also there was runtime fabric, I believe on Azure also mentioned. Um, so anyone in the chat who, who would like to vote, you know, maybe upvote any one of these topics, that would be great for me to, you know, attempt to prioritize these. Um, but I think they're, they're all great topics and uh, we could probably accomplish all of them in 2020. Uh, also, if you're looking to um, present on any one of these topics, feel free to reach out to me. And we're always looking for presenters because um, you guys are the ones that make this successful. And so you don't have to hear me talk every time. <laughs> Uh, so what's next? Um, tweet your pictures, use hashtag Mule Meetup. Um, we recorded this presentation. All of the content will be available um, to the public after the presentation, probably in the next day or two. If you have any feedback, feel free to send that in. Um, our next meetup will probably be, um, I'm thinking that the week probably after MuleSoft Connect, um, since there's a meetup there and, and, you know, the entire conference is at the end of May, you know, we can do something like May 27th since MuleSoft Connect is May 20th. Um, maybe even getting into the, the beginning of June there. Um, so most likely virtual. Um, Denver, Colorado is, is probably not going to be an option to, to do this in person at the end of May quite yet. And we'll decide on a topic together. Thank you all for putting your ideas there in the chat. And with that, um, usually we get a picture at this time, but we have the recording. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. We'll see you virtually next time and stay healthy out there. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. thank you very much, Mike. Thanks everyone for attending. Thanks Big Compass for setting this up and thanks for Swap for your help getting it going. Thanks, thanks, thank you guys. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.